He moves through the night as nimbly and secretly as a cat, squirting a Swedish gas through bedroom windows. His victims cough, awaken with burning throats, and find themselves successively afflicted with nausea, temporary paralysis, and a desire to describe their experiences in minutest detail. This latter result often enables them to overcome their symptoms with startling dispatch. I'm Samantha Engel. And I'm Aaron Gullius, and you're listening to Great Lakes Lore. A podcast where two historians dive into legends of murders, ghosts, cryptids, and more in the Great Lakes region. Today, the high-octane story of the mad gasser of Mattoon. It's ghastly. <sighs> Before we begin, uh, we just wanted to say thank you to the response we got to our first episode about the Dungeon Swamp Mystery. Download numbers, comments, questions, all was uh, was absolutely more than than we expected for a first episode about a a hyper local topic. So <laughs> we were um, we were thrilled, weren't we, Sam? Yes, yes. Um, appreciated all of the all of the listens and um, those who took time to rate and review us far exceeded, you know, attendance I had at my first ever museum program. So that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, I gave a series of, of library talks the other summer. And it was a good day when there was somebody besides me and library employees in the room. So uh, having <laughs> having this kind of response and feedback is is always nice. So the Mad Gasser. This one is this was this was my choice of topic. I will admit that I've always wanted to have an excuse to look into this and to cover it in depth, and it never escaped far enough into woo woo flying saucer territory for it to fit in with anything I've ever done. But it keeps popping up on the periphery of a lot of different subjects I'm interested in. So. You know, I liked it. So I thought since it takes place in Mattoon, Illinois, Great Lakes, I thought it would work just fine. So this is an interesting story. And what we're going to be doing is our, our usual sort of thing of going through the context of the time, the sources, and then some analysis of those sources. So Mattoon, Illinois, 1944. What the heck is going on, Sam? <laughs> yeah, so Mattoon is located in Coles County, Illinois, which is sort of in the middle of the state, if you're looking sort of north to south, sort of towards the east side. It exists between St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Louisville, Kentucky. It's kind of, when I looked at the map, I was surprised at how... If you like threw a dart and tried to <laughs> hit the bullseye in the middle of those big major cities at the time, um, it, it would be kind of where Mattoon is. It was founded in 1855 as a railroad community, of course, being sort of in its location. It'd be important for a lot of that transportation and, and shipping at the time. It was named after William B. Mattoon, an official of the Illinois Central Railroad. And by the late 1800s, it was largely agricultural. The town, though, grew quickly as sort of this transportation industry grew and um, also different commercial and manufacturing industries popped up on the periphery. But um, agriculture still sort of continued to reign supreme. And transportation, of course, was vital to its growth. And the automobile and energy demands of World War II then, if we're looking at the 1940s, really spurred development of oil fields near Mattoon in the 1940s. Uh, it's a very important shipping center on a sort of a major highway at this point. It's small, small-ish, um, but it is, it's important due to its location, really, and probably would have had a lot of people passing through it uh, in 1940 and maybe not so much today as more people are, you know, hitting, hitting the freeways. But it is, like I said, that it's got that central location. It's on I-57, which is major north-south Illinois 
interstate, the importance of logistics and shipping makes Mattoon and its location fairly significant. The incident we're going to be looking at today takes place in September of 1944, which is in the midst of the Second World War. And by September of 44, what you have going on is the Allies in Europe are doing their final push. The Battle of the Bulge is going to be coming up, but we are three months past D-Day. We're barreling our way across, across Western Europe. The Soviets are coming in from the east and smashing everything, man, woman, dog, child, in their path. I don't want to say the European war is in the bag, but it's close enough to the end that it's a question of when the war in Europe ends, not if the war in Europe ends. So that is uh, that is something to keep in mind because as we are going to see in the analysis section, some fears of desperate German last ditch efforts mm -hmm. to um, defeat the Americans were circulating that play into this. In the Pacific, it's still a slog. It's it's a bloody slog. Japan is on the back foot, but you know it, it's still the Pacific War is still very much a going concern. So what we're seeing in September of 1944 is a town that is one of the hundreds and hundreds of cities across the United States that is small, that is still, despite its size, making vital contributions to the war effort. And it's a town that is part of the arsenal of democracy. So that's sort of the time and place. Uh, let's turn to uh, turn to the sources. Sam, what are our sources? So the Mattoon Journal Gazette is the primary paper in Mattoon that's going to be reporting all of these things um, and eventually ends up getting picked up by larger newspapers and by some accounts, you know, becoming, you know, even a, a national story. Um, but we're really looking at Mattoon. And then we're also looking at some newspaper articles from Chicago being, you know, the local the local big city, <laughs> um, the big city in the state to see how the city is reporting it similar to our last episode where we you know had a lot of articles from Detroit and there we could notice differences in reporting styles for the event and we'll have to see what we think about this time so yes. we're going to dive into these articles as sort of a way to relate the story to you because it is such a consecutive series of events and the newspapers reporting each time something happens. So it's a perfect way for us to get the story. So the first attack happens on September 1st. So it's reported the next day on September 2nd. And the title was Anesthetic Prowler on Loose, Mrs. Kearney and Daughter First Victims. And uh, we found it interesting that they said first as though the newspaper knew they could foretell <laughs> that there was going to be a series of these gassings. Um, they didn't just report it as like, hey, some people were gassed last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they they set it up that way. The newspaper reports that both of these individuals recover. The prowler failed to get into the home, but Mrs. Bert Kearney and her daughter Dorothy were both affected. And uh, she said, quote, I first noticed a sickening sweet odor in the bedroom, but at the time thought that it might be from flowers outside the window. However, the odor grew stronger and I began to feel a paralysis in my legs and lower body. So also at the house were Mrs. Kearney's sister, Martha, another daughter and Martha's young son. A neighbor was called for help and that neighbor called the police as well as searching the yard, but they didn't see anybody in the yard. A strange figure, though, would arrive later. Mr. Kearney arrived home at 1230, and when he got there, he spotted the prowler peeping through the bedroom window. He said that the miscreant was, quote, tall, dressed in dark clothing, and wore a tight-fitting cap. The police were called again. They still found nothing. Mrs. Kearney got use of her legs and arms back in half an hour, and the daughter was better by the morning. So what was the anesthetic, the leading 
Candidates were, of course, chloroform, um, very, very common at the time, or ether, or maybe some strange combination of both. Both would explain the parched throat and the mouth burns that were suffered by these two victims. And of course, we must wonder what the motivation could be of someone to attack these women. And the the theory that was posited was that the women acknowledged that they had um, considerable sums of money at the house and had been counting it, and someone saw them through the window. So they just happened to pull out their strange mix of chloroform and ether and gas them, I guess, <laughs> in an attempt to uh, to steal their money. <laughs> and, and, you know, the idea of somebody driving around looking in people's windows with the equipment in the trunk. Well, I got my right. knockout gas in the trunk in case anything looks interesting. That, that's that's right. actually really chilling. It's like, yeah, I can give you a ride to the airport. Ne- never mind the chloroform and duct tape in the back seat. That's just <laughs> something I carry for emergencies. I do like that she was like, the women were sort of saying, well, you know, we were sort of flashing a lot of cash through the window. So it's kind of <laughs> kind of grasping at straws, but putting yeah. together some sort of reasonable mm-hmm. criminal justice system based <laughs> reason why this might have happened rather than it's just a crazy person spraying gas well and we all know from watching you know batman the dark knight that people fear the criminal who just does things to watch the world burn or whatever they said yeah i suppose (laughs) i i'm i'm a marvel guy um but (laughs) (laughs) i love batman (laughs) so Yes, let's watch the world burn as we move to September 5th in the (laughs) Mattoon Journal. That's so overselling it a little bit. But uh, September 5th in the Mattoon Journal Gazette headline, Anesthetic Prowler. Again, Anesthetic Prowler. They got a nickname for the guy already. Mm -hmm. Anesthetic Prowler covers city. And both Samantha and the headline said first victims, but they weren't the first victims, as we learn on the 5th. This is information about an earlier attack including a guy named Urban, I think, Rafe, R-A-E-F, it might be Reef, who also, in my research, I found was an avid amateur bowler. He appeared in far more <laughs> news stories about his bowling league than he ever did about the, uh, about the, the mad gasser. Reef told police of an incident from the week prior, uh, the day before the Kearney attack, so August 31st. He said he and his wife woke up at 3 in the morning feeling ill, and they were paralyzed. They, they couldn't move. He said, quote, there was a peculiar heavy odor in the bedroom, and I, at first, thought it was gas. I asked my wife if she had left the gas stove on, but she hadn't. We both had the same feeling of paralysis and felt ill for approximately one and one half hours. Persons visiting us who slept in another part of the house received none of the fumes and were not altered in any way, end quote. So also reported in the September 5th issue of the Journal Gazette, the Ryder family said that the the Prowler had been at their house late Friday night after being scared away from the Kearney home. Mr. Ryder worked nights and he arrived home in the morning and his wife told him that she smelled something odd in the house, not like chloroform, and that it had made the kids restless and she was lightheaded. So another Prowler incident. But the effects of the gas don't seem as severe as in the case of the Kearneys. So maybe uh, he had used, he or she, had used too much of his gas at the Kearney house. And so he only had a little bit left um, to use at the riders. And that's why (laughs) they weren't as severely affected. (laughs) I'm out. I can't believe I'm out of my knockout gas. So embarrassing. They just kind of look uncomfortable. (laughs) Can't steal their money. I was going to say party foul. It's more like like a you know assault foul or crime against <laughs> humanity foul. I've, I've run out of poison gas. <laughs> so then on September 6th, we have our next newspaper article with the headline, Anesthetic Prowler Adds Victim. The article begins by noting that after a few days off, people 
whomever these people are, we're not sure. <laughs> but they believed that the anesthetic prowler had fled the city, but they were wrong. There's another victim. There were, the story said, five reported cases until now, all largely the same as that of the Kearney family. So if we can keep that one in mind, that's sort of like a baseline <laughs> um, for, for gasser incidents. And this one happened with the Cordes family. Um, and Mrs. Cordes recounted, my husband and I arrived home about 10 o'clock Tuesday night and according to our usual custom, entered our home through the rear door. We had been in the house a few minutes and were sitting in the front room when we noticed a white cloth on the front porch against the screen door. I picked up the cloth, which was larger than a man's handkerchief, and unfolded it. There was a large wet spot in the center inside the fold, and without thinking, I brought the cloth to my face and smelled it. When I inhaled the fumes from the cloth, I had a sensation similar to coming in contact with a strong electric current. The feeling raced down my body to my feet and then seemed to settle in my knees. Everything settles in my knees, too. <laughs> it was a feeling of paralysis. Uh, her lips also of it swelled up. The roof of her mouth and her throat burned, which um, happened with the, the other gas incidents. Um, and she began to spit blood. Her husband called the doctor and she felt normal after two hours. But there were a few physical clues left this time. Mrs. Cordes said that on the sidewalk at the edge of the front porch, she found a skeleton key, which gave evidence of being used frequently, and a large lipstick tube with the contents nearly gone. Um, so these are the first two actual pieces, um, or three pieces with the cloth, um, three pieces of physical evidence that we have from these attacks. So... This is this is just a, a a weird thing, but I want to get your opinion on this, Sam. <sighs> if there was something strange going on in your house and there was a cloth on the front porch, like a handkerchief with a wet spot in the middle, <laughs> is your first instinct to just like just start huffing it? No, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, because I, I thought maybe I was just maybe I'm I'm not very adventurous sometimes with strange substances on my porch. So I thought maybe <laughs> it was me. But um, every time I read that story, I was just thinking, why would she mm -hmm. do that? I mean, if it's found in my house, that's different. But outside right. the house, I'd probably just assume it was garbage and throw it away. Or given what's going on in the town, I would have just straight away taken it to the police. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and the police were on the case. They were. Yeah. So the cloth was eventually submitted for analysis. But the police chief of Metoon, um, C.E. Cole, said he doubted if the cloth would yield the answer to the drug being used. Clearly, he didn't have faith in this. No, <laughs> um, no. They also picked up a man about a block from the Cortez home a short time after the incident, um, thinking, you know, he was looking rather suspicious. Um, but he was released. He told police he was merely lost. Um, I feel like if I was a gasser, that's what I'd tell him, too. Yeah. <laughs> I ignore my <laughs> ignore the odor of chloroform yes. surrounding me. <laughs> um. They also checked out a location that could have been the gasser's hideout. And uh, this was just noted in, <laughs> in the news article. Um, I'm laughing because Aaron sort of threw his hands up. And <laughs> I don't know what that would be. <laughs> um, disbelief <laughs> of the insanity. Yes, um, but, <laughs> it, you know, I, I don't know how they got this information. I don't know what a gasser's hideout would look like if someone tipped him off. We don't know. This is just what the newspaper said. <laughs> um, they found nothing there, by the way. <laughs> we found the gasser's hideout. What, what, hey, um, okay, so the only way you would know or, or suspect it's the gasser's hideout is if, I don't know, there's chemistry paraphernalia there. <laughs> it looks like whatever the anesthetic gas equivalent of a meth lab looks like. It, there, there'd be something to say, this looks like the hideout of a gasser. But then there's nothing to support the idea. I heart chloroform on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, people are being attacked. There's an old woman spitting blood, but it gets sillier. <laughs> September 7th, headline, Mattoon Journal-Gazette. 
mad anesthetist strikes again. Yes, there's an exclamation point at the end of the headline. The next <laughs> night, they report two more women fell victim to the attack. They claim similar sensations of, of what the smell is. It's sweet. It's like a bad perfume. Uh, the scent of gardenias comes up a lot in these descriptions. They have weakened legs. They're, they feel paralyzed and they're nauseous. The night of these attacks, uh, the police had called in the day police. So you got the night the night shift going. <laughs> you call in the day shift. And this is going to be a recurring thing. Community volunteers. <laughs> That night, the reports of prowlers became coming into the station, and a few were near the Kearney residence. And overall, these incidents were concentrated on the northwest side of Mattoon, uh, which some people think is is a clue, and other people think is is, is kind of a, a a red herring. It's it's like maybe this is this is where they are happening, so people just believe they're happening in this area and chief cole noted in the article that many of them this is going to play into stuff many of the calls <laughs> could possibly be because of nerves people are just kind of freaking out about this whole thing and the article concludes by saying those who customarily live alone have begun staying with friends and family so the newspaper's doing some stuff here isn't it You've got this this headline with the exclamation point that takes it for granted that there is a mad anesthetist and that he is striking. It doesn't say another report of strange gas symptoms, mm -hmm. which would be a little more sensible. And that, you know, people are scared. They're huddling together for security they don't want to be by themselves because of the mad anesthetist mm -hmm. so th this is the, the coverage is becoming slightly more lurid yeah and on that same day we have our chicago tribune article to look at and they really relate the happenings in mattoon in a very straightforward way they report that the police had ordered officers on a 24-hour watch. And the next day, the headline gave no indication that the Tribune was treating these events lightly, however. Um, the headline read, Mattoon Fiend fells two more with poison gas. 13 persons are victims of Night Prowler. So it's not, you know, there's no exclamation points. You know, they're not using mad anesthetists or anything <laughs> like that they're not sensationalizing things they are treating it as though there's a there's a criminal there's a crime and this thing is happening i i think i would i i i don't disagree uh, i i kind of disagree um i would say that saying poison gas is a little bit sensationalistic it's not as lurid as the mattoon paper Listeners, if you were here, you would see that that she's got a look on her face of like, I think you're wrong, Gullius. Um, but I, 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 I would, if I were an editor, I would have kicked that back saying, come on, mystery gas, mystery gas. We don't know what mm. the gas is. We haven't identified the gas. So how do we know? Well, they are still trying to sell papers. But they didn't take it far in the other way of being like, Mattoon people are going crazy and thinking they're being true, gassed. I mean, true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it, it feels like the middle line of the two things that could be going on. I guess that was I can, my I point. Can see, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I'm, I'm not mad at it. I, I just I just think that, that, that poison gas, it is it is a paper selling thing. But the Tribune, relatively classy outfit. I mean, it's, it's no tabloid or anything. Um, and... <laughs> Okay, I'll accept it. Poison gas is not as lurid, not as lurid as what's to come. I'll tell you that. So speaking of what's to come, two days later on the 9th, there's another there's another headline from the Journal Gazette. And okay, this sort of Sam just kind of proves your point about the difference in, in the reporting. Mad Gasser adds six victims, exclamation point. Okay, yes. We've got <laughs> Whenever you throw in the punctuation, I, that just... I, I, it just seems like we're, we're just we're just you know gilding the lily here. We, we we've got his <laughs> we've got his nickname. We're, we're branding him. Frankly, I will say I'm glad Mad Gasser is what we presently call him because saying anesthetist over and over again is is not a fun thing to do. <laughs> Listeners know that it's been a struggle. <laughs> Anesthetic prowler. 
is is another one, but aneth, uh, anesthetist. Yeah, it's it's yes. tongue twister <laughs> territory. So the victims reported in the September 9th article are five women, noticing a trend, five women and mm-hmm. one boy over two households. And it seemed that the Journal Gazette's reporting seemed to be trending toward, and, and this is maybe an anachronistic term, but, but it's tabloid style reporting. It's, it's exaggeration for continued sales, continued interest. This is a, a little snippet from the article. The mad Mattoon anesthetist whose terror provoking activities of the past week have provided the strangest case in local police annals and one of the weirdest in the nation today had added six more victims to his steadily expanding list. Come <laughs> on, man. Terror-provoking activities, the strangest case in the local police annals, and the weirdest I mean, probably in, the in Mattoon, it, it, it would be. Yeah, but, uh... I, I, yeah, but I, weirdest <laughs> in the nation, I, I draw the line at weirdest in the nation. No. So the, the things that people are reporting here are, are very similar. Nausea, vomiting, in quotes, stomach disorders, which I think is a euphemism for diarrhea. I, I, I'm, I'm almost yes. positive. Parched mouth, parched throat. Um, flower-like smell, but they saw a thin blue vapor. Richard Piper, who is the superintendent of the State Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, was on the scene as well. And he said, quote, the perpetrator of the attacks must be mentally unbalanced, but intelligent, possibly brilliant. The man is a nut, end quote. (laughs) He told the police to keep alert at every moment. The same day, the Chicago Tribune is reporting that the people of Mattoon were not happy with the efforts of the police. Quote, business leaders planned a public mass meeting to reassure the townspeople who, armed with shotguns and rifles, joined the search for the attacker and to protest the ineffectiveness of police actions. So you've got a situation where the townspeople don't think the police are taking it seriously, but the police have you know basically pulled in every officer they have and are trying to solve this thing but how do you solve it when your only physical clues are a handkerchief a skeleton key and a mostly empty <laughs> lipstick things are clearly unraveling a bit in Mattoon yeah and then suddenly on um the 11th of September so 2 days later the journal gazette's headline changes uh it says Many Prowler reports, few real, city calmer after wild weekend. So we go from mad gasser, victims, insanity, um, to, yeah, there were some reports, but it was mostly like raccoons and yeah, stuff. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not even bad enough for you, to us to use an exclamation point. It, it's so, so clearly. No, no. <laughs> it's, things have settled down, which is, which is it, the, the switch is just, mm-hmm. is just bizarre. And suspicious. Yeah. And yeah. And the newspaper article also um, points out a few other things in regards to the actions of the police. Uh, Five squads of state police arrived to supplement Mattoon's police force and dozens of reports came in over the weekend. But again, there was no solid evidence. The armed mobs were ordered to stop following the police around on their calls, (laughs) which just seems like a good policy in general. While none of the alleged victims, when examined by doctors, had evidence, the situation was still, according to this newspaper article, being taken seriously. So a few people had, you know, agreed to be examined by a doctor and there was no no evidence of, of what could be going on. It also reported that there was an FBI agent in town watching the case unfold. But the article said, Quote, it was understood that the FBI's chief interest in the case was the gas used by the madman. So they're not really interested in helping the situation. <laughs> they just, what have they got and how are they gas? doing it? <laughs> Can we have some? Right. Uh, the police continue to search for suspects, though, and announced that they would be looking to see if any patients recently discharged from area uh, mental institutions, as the newspaper called them, would fit the bill of the mad anesthetist. So I've got to go back to this FBI thing because th- this is <laughs> uh, this this isn't a rabbit hole, but this is something that I found very interesting. 
you've got this news report from the Journal Gazette saying an FBI an FBI agent has come down from Springfield. Nearly every account of this that you read mentions the presence of usually two FBI agents. Now, I am not any sort of archival genius. I, I'm sub genius level on uh, on archive stuff, but I've. We're selling this based on our abilities to do high quality archival I am research. Bleeding brilliant <laughs> at archival research. Actually, I, I, I will say I've I've got some FOIA requests under my belt. I've got some successful FOIA requests <laughs> under my belt. Uh, so I, I I am aware that you have to write things in a fairly specific way. Uh, my FOIA request for you know the presence of FBI personnel in Mattoon, Illinois, between these dates and these dates. Uh, came up uh, came up with with nothing and it came up with nothing very quickly and it wasn't and it was a nothing nothing it wasn't a um, the so-called glomar response which is we can neither confirm nor deny the existence of these mm-hmm. records which are the coolest ones to get because you know that's good stuff <laughs> but you'll never see right. it so what i'm saying is i've seen no evidence beyond this police report that the FBI was there. I've seen other references to the FBI assisting in analysis of the gas and analysis of the handkerchief rather than being in an investigative capacity. But if I'm a newspaper editor and a guy brought me a story and it said the FBI have have dispatched a lab assistant, uh, say agent, say agent that sounds that sounds better so um i will keep you updated i'm going to revise my foia request i've got some uh i've got a foia guy who's done a bunch of this stuff and i'm gonna get (laughs) get uh get his feedback so the search for suspects continues who's behind this And, and then on september 12th the journal gazette has a discussion of the case and they report there were four suspects and they also say no more genuine attacks <laughs> of the anesthetist were reported, and they appear to be de-escalating things. The word, and, and I, I'm, I'm attuned to punctuation, as you've noticed from my <laughs> exclamation point pointing out. I don't think they'd done this before in this way, but they put the word anesthetist in mm-hmm. sarcasm quotes, as we call them today. <laughs> So they put it in quotes. It's like, oh, yeah, the anesthetist. Yeah, so that's weird. And the article also states uh, that two of the four suspects are amateur chemists and the others are crackpots. (laughs) So kind. So there's no new victims on Monday the 11th, reported on the 12th. There is still hysteria. And at one home, there was evidence of attempted entry, but nobody had any physical symptoms. There was no odor of gas left over. So these attempted break-in, which happens. Most people who called the police were diagnosed with extreme mental anguish, that's their phrase, and given sedatives by doctors, which seems a little sort of loosey-goosey on the, you know, <laughs> dangerous substances. Just go sleep it go off. Go sleep it off. Yeah. Oh, you, you think the mad gasser got you? Yeah, go, go, uh, go, go sleep it off. Exactly. <laughs> and officials are still working out what the gas might have been. And the newspaper said this, quote, every person who reported a gas attack is being asked to submit to the odors of lewisite, mustard gas, methyl chloride, tear gas, and chloropicrin. He said the odor of chloropicrin was the most suggestive to those who reported the attacks. It is made by subjecting picric acid to chloroform, an easy process for an amateur chemist, end quote. So then on September 13th, the Journal Gazette continued this trend, I should say, of of de-escalating things. And the headline is actually gas calls at vanishing point. (laughs) So so things are things things were they were down here. Then they went up here. You know, imagine my hand up in the air and now they're back down there. The police the previous night had dealt with two false alarms, um, which they call them false alarms in the article one of which was a noisy cat Um, so obviously the people are still jumpy they hear the noise and call the police thinking the prowlers out there with their gas (laughs) the police also though had put together a solution to the entire the entire thing they had a theory they had an idea 
Chief Cole posited that carbon tetrachloride had come from the nearby Atlas Imperial Diesel Engine Company, which I imagine was probably doing a lot of work oh, yeah. during uh, <laughs> during the war. <laughs> Um, or, or maybe another factory around, it kind of just seemed like then he just started like throwing out <laughs> various other industries that were within some kind of radius. Um, but he really calls out the Atlas Imperial company. He dispels the idea that it could have been a war gas because it wasn't harmful enough. These people all had mild ish. I don't know. I mean, paralysis is bad, but they were better it, in two it's hours. A, it's, so. If it's a chemical <laughs> weapon, it's a really ineffective one. Yeah, it's not a good one. But of course, the Atlas Imperial uh, Engine Company was not happy with this at all. And the newspaper article printed this quote from them. We deny that the strange gas, which has been described variously as having having a sickening sweet odor and smelling like gardenias, is coming from this plant. There is less than five gallons of carbon tetrachloride mentioned in Chief Cole's statement at our plant at this time. This being the amount used monthly in small fire extinguishers. We do use a quantity of trichloroethylene in the plant. However, the fumes from it cannot be responsible for the mystery gas for persons working in the plant would be the first to notice or be affected. And also, I would just like to point out that if there was some mass of, of something coming from a company, it would be affecting people broadly it wouldn't just be seeping into occasionally certain homes windows so this seems really like a stretch on a lot of levels it really is and because he says it's you know it's coming from the factory not somebody from the factory mm -hmm. who works there has made off with a couple gallons of carbon oh yeah that could make sense that's not no, what that's saying, like, I was like, oh, so wait, no, <laughs> that's no, they picked the dumbest way to explain this. So, yeah, I actually hadn't even thought about that. What you just said, because I just interpreted I was just taking Chief Cole for what he said and thought, mm, this doesn't make sense, Chief Cole. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was like, do, do, you, do you think he meant that they were like, like, like the gasser worked at the plant and then sort of made off with the chemical and was was spraying it at people? But mm -hmm. no, that's not what they're saying. <laughs> so by the 14th of September, the Journal Gazette had declared, quote, all quiet on Mattoon's gas front, with calls decreasing to one the previous evening, a false alarm. Doctors declared overwrought nerves to be the culprit in several more cases. And in these cases, they had analyzed the stomach contents of victims. So I, I guess they induced vomiting and then examined the stomach contents and found nothing that would have, you know, uh, affected things. Oh, and I don't remember it being mentioned. I don't remember if it was in the newspaper article, but I think wasn't it with the first attack that they wondered the ladies who, well, the, the mother and the daughter wondered if it was the yes, hot dogs that they had eaten. A eaten, hot dog like supper. Hot dogs. Yes, a hot dog <laughs> supper was the phrase, which sounds like. Which caused my legs to lose mobility. I, I, I ate a hot dog supper and then reclined on the Davenport for the evening. It, it, it just sounds like such a, a thing one of my great aunts would have said back in the day. A hot dog <laughs> supper. Now, the day before. On the 13th, the Chicago Tribune published a story declaring the events mass hysteria, and they reiterated the explanation of fumes from the Atlas Imperial Company and from another source as well. <laughs> Quote, in another case, the reported victim lived adjacent to a bicycle shop which used a strong smelling paint remover. In one case, in the western part of the city, we found a bottle of spoiled nail polish emitting strong fumes near the window of a person who reported being attacked. Nail polish? Sam? So as a female who paints her nails, I will say that I did not know it could spoil, first of all. I have some very, very, very old nail polish that has not caused me any paralysis or or mouth burnings or anything. Would you describe so. the odor of nail polish as sickeningly sweet? No. It's got no. the burning thing going for it. I'm maybe I'm just too used to it. <laughs> I don't notice the burning. You may, you but, may have um, a problem if you It's yeah. <laughs> I see oh, oh, well, okay, the thing is, the thing about the burning is you've got to you've you've just got to like 
snort that stuff. You have to eat you, it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. For yeah, yeah, you have to eat. I, you have to eat it. I, I was just thinking like you have to like. You would have to eat it in order to like. You couldn't just sniff it and be like, "Oh my gosh, well, my nose and mouth are on fire, and there's blood dripping from my lips." And <laughs> well, yeah, for the for the blood. Dri- I was thinking more along the lines of if I if I walk up to to if my wife had just gotten a pedicure and Mm -hmm. um somehow i make my way into the spa before the polish is dry this analogy is going off the rails incredibly quickly but it's not dry yet there's there's wet nail polish if i walk up to her feet and i go (gasps) and sort of inhale (laughs) the still wet polish i could see that burning Okay, so listeners, do you see how far afield we had to go to even make this nail polish explanation even remotely plausible? <laughs> and we're not even scientists. And I'm still not even buying that, so. <laughs> Basically, the Mattoon police attempted to say that while there may have been an occasional prowler, the connection between the prowler and any gas effects was coincidental. There wasn't anybody squirting gas in. There might have been somebody in your yard looking shady. There might have been some gas that was mm-hmm. bugging you. That doesn't mean these two things are connected. The town was not happy. On September 14th, the Chicago Tribune stated that there was, quote, a bitter controversy over the phantom gas prowler that, quote, split Mattoon wide open today as police officials tried to discount the entire scare as a hoax and businessmen branded the police as incompetent, end quote. <laughs> So the police are branding it a hoax when the police had said, "Okay, everybody on duty for this. We're calling in the state police. No, just a hoax. There's there's no there's no middle gear here, is there? It's just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. zero to 100 to zero on these explanations. And that pretty much ended the regular coverage of the Mattoon Gasser case, both in Mattoon and in Chicago. It, It sort of fell away as quickly as it arrived. Yeah, there is one other source um, that we're going to talk about four days later. um, Time Magazine, actually, like the Time Magazine, ran a story, um, but it was not... It was not favorable to to the folks of Mattoon and the incident. Um, It was quite tongue in cheek. So I'm going to read a bit of this to you. None of them has seen the mad anesthetist at his work, nor heard his hollow laugh. But last week, citizens of Mattoon were watching for him any and every midnight. The mad anesthetist began his nocturnal visitations two weeks ago, mainly concentrating his fiendish attacks on women. One said a smell like gardenias made her legs tingle. Another said a fat man had squirted perfume into her bedroom. Mrs. Carl Cortez discovered a damp pink cloth on her back porch. She sniffed it and immediately felt as though a charge of electricity had gone through me. She was taken to a hospital with burns and temporary paralysis. It was at once obvious to Mattoon's housewives that the anesthetist had baited Mrs. Cordes's porch with a cloth soaked in the same substance he squirted through windows. After that, the number of his victims increased. So, yeah, it's it's making it a bit silly (laughs) and... In another part of that time story that we didn't read, it said that he had been noted with a flit gun, which I had I had to Google that because I had no idea what, the, what a flit gun was. But as soon as I saw a picture, I knew it because I'm old enough to remember my parents spraying plants with the thing. It's a long cylindrical thing with like a pump handle at the end and it goes whoosh, 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 and sprays like, are you laughing at my sound effect? <laughs> I am. (laughs) None of the stories I saw really had the guy or woman holding anything like this. But the assumption is if they're squirting something in there, they'd be squirting something designed to squirt some kind of gas. But that's a that's a very early example of some details kind of being grafted on here because it's a tongue in cheek thing. Mm -hmm. But as we're going to see after the break. Things get grafted onto this story left and right. (music) 
Next time on Great Lakes Lore, you'll get to hear our own paranormal encounters and kind of how we deal with these personal stories and personal narratives, which are so often an integral piece of putting together these pieces of lore and legends. You can subscribe to Great Lakes Lore at greatlakeslore.com or wherever you find podcasts. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Links are, oh, and YouTube. Links are in the show notes. Great Lakes Lore relies on listener donations rather than advertising. If you like what you hear and want to hear more, there are links in the show notes and at greatlakeslore.com to contribute. What we'd also like to ask is that if you have any questions or comments about this episode, to let us know. Drop a comment on social media, either under this episode where you saw this linked or in a dedicated question and answer post that might pop up later later in the week and on monday a week from when this episode drops we'll be doing another youtube video where we answer those questions in our monday mail call segment and now it's time for legend or lie all right listeners if you remember last week aaron stumped me with his legend of the woman grabbed by the strange cryptid (laughs) in the Ohio River. And so now it's my turn to try to stump him. I'm going to present a story, which is either a real legend, which as we mentioned last week, doesn't mean it's real, but it's an actual legend. (laughs) Um, Or if it is, um, in fact, a lie that I have made up. So this week, I'm presenting this. So Aaron, You are familiar with Mackinac Island, correct? I've been there once. I didn't bring a bike, but I walked the whole thing. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Yeah. It is eight miles around. It is. I was very tired. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who don't know, Mackinac Island is a little island um, in the Straits of Mackinac, which is between Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas. Um, you can see it from the Mackinac Bridge. Um, it's sort of a touristy destination. Um, so are you familiar then with Arch Rock on Mackinac Island? No, I've been there once and was very tired from walking. <laughs> Bet. And, 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 you and, can and, see arch rock from the ground. <laughs> it's an arch. I mean, it's a rock that is an arch. So okay. that, that's I, all we I've, really need to know. The, I've got the picture, yeah. <laughs> so like so many other um, things on Mackinac Island and Mackinac Island itself, um, it is steeped in history. And part of that history is um, Ojibwe history. And so there is a legend about the creation of arch rock. And it is that a uh, Ojibwe chief had angered this monster that lived in the Straits of Mackinac. And so in order to get back at him, this monster reached out his long um, tentacle-like flipper and sort of crashed through the rock, creating the formation that is today Arch Rock. So the the arch is the arm sort of stretching over and then sort of... No, he crashed the hole through it. Like the Kool-Aid man <laughs> going through the wall. <laughs> okay, now... Oh, 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 shoot. Now, okay. Um, okay, I think it's real and I don't have a reason why. <laughs> um, it is a lie. I How? completely made that up. <laughs> oh! Ugh. Ah, so I, I, I will. Okay, I'll tell you my actual reason. I, I, I thought it was real. It's like Sam's not going to to manufacture a Native American myth. <laughs> I totally did. She totally did. Um, okay, it is. Um, <laughs> I am O for one. We are both O for one. We're, yeah. We are. Well, I'm an excellent truth teller. Sam's an excellent liar. So I do like to make up stories. What a team. Okay. <laughs> Oh, let's get back to the show. The Mad Gasser's name was Farley. Now we're going to dive into some of the possible explanations of what actually happened, because what you just heard are the primary sources available. The only physical evidence was the cloth, lipstick, and skeleton key found outside of the Cortez house. And today, a search of Mattoon's online presence, including the Cole County Historical Society, which we checked that out, um, they ignored this episode in their history. 
Many people have taken a stab at explaining what happened here. Some of these explanations connect to folks entrenched in paranormal research, having published books on things as oddly specific as paranormal smells, and others come from psychological studies and comparisons to other similar events, and another from a chemistry teacher who thinks it was an actual criminal. So in order to make this easy for you to follow, we'll be going in the same order I just used. Paranormal, psychological, and criminal. And I'm going to start off the paranormal talking about a, uh, a writer named Nick Redfern. And if you've ever been in the paranormal or new age section of like Barnes & Noble or Books A Million or one of those chains, you will have seen at least three books by Nick Redfern. He has written comprehensive books on things all under the paranormal sun. And in his book, The Real Men in Black... Redfern makes the claim that the Mad Gasser of Mattoon, quote, is a bizarre figure that during the 1930s terrorized the women of Botetot County, Virginia, and a decade later did likewise in Mattoon, Illinois, end quote. Oh, really? So in Botetot County, Virginia, late December 33, January 34, there was a surprisingly similar rash of events, gas smells, illness, mostly women victims, newspapers promoting the idea of a gasser as a fact rather than speculation. It's it's tangential, to related but tangential to what we're doing here. And like Mattoon, the case fades fairly quickly. So what, what Redfern is saying is that it's the same person, literally. I haven't found anyone else who does this. And Redfern in later writings doesn't do that either. He kind of walks that back. So why is this in a book about the men in black? Redfern explains, quote, Some might suggest that the presence of a darkly dressed, sinister man in a hat, coupled with an overpowering aroma that filled the bedroom and that had a negative effect on the victim, are highly reminiscent of Albert Bender's MIB experience in 1953. Here come the men in black. Galaxy Defenders? Is that the next <laughs> I line? think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, so maybe you should take a second to explain the Men in Black to folks out there. I know we're attracting folks from various paranormal and just sort of weird history <laughs> walks of life. There's a persistent legend of men, occasionally women, in dark clothes, fairly official looking, who threaten or intimidate ufo witnesses into being silent that's sort of the thumbnail sketch and albert bender who redfern mentions from 1953 was the first sort of original sort of encounterer of the men in black people will quibble but go with me here his encounter came after he realized he thought he knew what the explanation of the saucers flying saucers was three men appeared in his room they appeared with the odor of sulfur. He experienced a headache and they roughed him up verbally and told him not to tell anybody. So what's weird about this is that the only similarities between this MIB experience and what happened with the Mad Gasser is it was in a bedroom and somebody might have been wearing black. Other than that, it's really not similar at all. And the biggest thing is the smell of sulfur. The, the sulfurous smell, because I think we can all say it together. Sickly sweet, gardenias, mm -hmm. not sulfur. And when we first looked at this, Sam, you said, what do you associate sulfur smells with? Demons. Demons, demon possession. And you mentioned oddly specific books about odors in the paranormal. <laughs> One of these is uh, by Joshua Cutchin, and it's called the The Brimstone Deceit. And it's about this sulfury smell that occurs in various places in, in the paranormal and in, in, in various kinds of encounters. And Cutchin brings up the Mad Gasser, and, and he notes that although sulfur in high enough concentrations, it can have a sickly sweet odor. However, at those mm -hmm. concentrations, people die. So... <laughs> He he doesn't really put that into into this uh, into this category. So many points to Cutchin for being reasonable about this. Now, of course, there is a figure that connects supposedly the Mad Gasser not only to the paranormal but to the past. And Sam is going to tell us a little bit about this person. 
Yeah. And um, I'm going to say before I start that I'm going to give a shout out to um, Astonishing Legends because I did find a lot of my information about this character from one of their very, very early episodes. So if you want more detail on it, because I'm going to give just an overview, it is the story of Spring Heel Jack. This takes place in 1830s. Well, it starts taking place in 1830s London, um, which just seems like a terribly sooty place. I I don't want to (laughs) be... (laughs) Um, But there was a rash of reportings of this tall, thin, you know, sort of black clothed, um, big sort of oil coat, I think is one one thing that was mentioned um, of being used uh, character who was jumping out, scaring people, largely ladies or or even just kind of like playing at something to, to get them to to come to him. And then he would attack them he would tear their clothes some of those who attacked reported seeing his eyes glowing red um fire blue fire coming from his mouth there's the blue also um some reports had him carrying a blue lantern um that sort of had a a a glow about it that caused um sort of a disorienting effect on those who were around them and so there was a rash of these sightings um everybody was you know sort of Ah, we're going to see spring. What if we see spring heeled Jack or like it was a thing everybody knew was happening. And then it sort of petered out. They did in this Astonishing Legends episode mention that there were a few later sightings, like like much later in history, even in, in the 1900s. But of course, then you have to wonder, like people know of the story of spring heeled Jack. So are they just sort of interpreting or projecting, you know, something that they know onto something that they are seeing. Oh, and I forgot to mention the most obvious thing. He is called spring Jack because he could leap in these giant, like nine foot bounds. You know, all of a sudden they'd see him like in the distance. This one report was seeing him from a carriage, I think. And in the distance, he was almost just like galloping across the way you picture like a deer doing it sort of jumping galloping, but it was just, you know, the, the silhouette of a man. Um, and so he had sort of this, you know, superhuman ability. <laughs> Um, in addition to like breathing fire and having red eyes, of course. <laughs> People have made a connection between spring Jack and the Mad Gasser. And the earliest one I found is in a 1961 issue of Flying Saucer Review. A guy named uh, Jay Viner uh, believes that spring Jack was an alien or at least some kind of non-human entity because of the leaping ability, because of the blue glowing lantern, which Viner describes as a ray gun. He claims that... The Mad Gasser was a, quote, later incarnation of spring Jack, but he gets a bunch of details wrong about the Mad Gasser stuff. He says victims, quote, were left stunned by a device pointed at them, which made consciousness dissolve in a fiery whirl mm. with the sweet odor left behind rather than it being a gas that affected people. Well, there was, you know, the ray gun and there was an odor after the ray gun dissipated like gunpowder after a gun goes off or something like that and that doesn't Mm -hmm. tally with any of the reports from the time it it just doesn't match up and then honestly not many people were reading flying saucer review in 1961 but a lot of people read jacques valet's seminal book passport to magonia and valet picked up viner's spring hill jack mad gasser connection and sort of immortalizes it in this book that is an absolute classic of the paranormal and UFO field. And if you look at the page in the book, the Mad Gasser story is in a list of events under the section called A Century of UFO Landings. There's no UFO, much less one that landed. Yeah, so now we're going to move away from these paranormal explanations in part because I don't think either of them, either of us nope, really buy them. Not at all. <laughs> um, not at all. Um, and we're going to move into sort of the mass hysteria interpretation of what happened, which, you know, as we noted, was something that was brought up by Police Chief Cole by the end of the experience by the Chicago Tribune tended towards hysteria. So one thing that I want to point out is that the word hysteria has a very gendered past. Um, The word hysteria comes from the Greek word hystera, which means womb. And traditionally, it's been interpreted as sort of 
a female illness. Anytime a woman was not acting the way men thought they should, they were hysterical. And so that's sort of where this word took hold. And it has been used to describe, you know, everything from anxiety, depression, especially postpartum depression, um, just, just all kinds of things that now we understand are actually other mental health issues that affect all people. Um, and so instead of the word hysteria, I have seen the acronym MPI used, which stands for mass psychogenic illness. While that's a mouthful to say, and I feel like I will still use the word hysteria, um, I just <laughs> want you all to know out there that there are other words, there is other language that we can use that has a far less troublesome and as I said, gendered past. But we're going to look at these examples or, or these folks who sort of attributed what happened in Mattoon to these MPIs. And the first came um, in 1945. So just a year after the event took place, it was written by Donald M. Johnson. And he was a student, a freshman student <laughs> at the University of Illinois. And so he wrote up this uh, roughly 12 page report on what he thinks, what he thought happened in Mattoon. And there are issues, uh, as you know, I think nobody should take a paper I wrote as a college freshman <laughs> and use it to explain some great historical event that I was trying to analyze. Uh, so I, I read this report. He starts off by outlining the facts of the case the same way we did. The number of reports of gassings and prowlers are also then looked at, and he notes that they both increase sharply after the first in incident and then they decline just as just as suddenly which matches the newspaper headlines that we read to you and he said that the folks in town the police interpreted this as unusual because there are usually occasional reports of sort of outside prowlers but there's like none um, for a while after this report happened. I think I saw mentioned somewhere that it wasn't until October then that another prowler was reported. Johnson then said that this could be explained by hysteria because, you know, doesn't that just mean that now that the police, you know, said, hey, don't worry about it. It was either something coming from the Atlas Imperial Company or we were all just kind of freaking out together. So clearly that's why that's why it stopped. That's why everything stopped. And the fact that they d maybe someone didn't even report another stranger that they saw in town, you know, that's that's why that stopped. But honestly, when we look at that, um, the police really sort of encouraged folks not to call in any of these reports. You know, they said that any false reports, you know, these people would be questioned. They could be, um, you know, sort of imprisoned or, you know, if they didn't submit to a medical exam, you know, their report wasn't going to be taken seriously. So they were really discouraged from reporting anything. So this is one thing that I think Johnson got wrong. He wasn't looking at, you know, all of these other elements inside of that. He analyzed the inches dedicated to the story in the newspapers. So he literally would say so many inches on the, of, the, of the newspaper on this day was dedicated to that story. So there's a lot about that. And then he also analyzes the characteristics of the, quote, susceptible sample and hypothesizes that they were mostly uneducated women who were susceptible. So again, he thinks and he interprets hysteria sort of the old way. So women, you know, with their weaker dispositions <laughs> were, were more susceptible to falling prey to sort of hysterics. Um, and he also seems to sort of hint at a connection to intelligence intelligence as well. So, you know, folks who weren't as educated, who didn't have as worldly of experiences, these were the ones who were going to be, you know, calling in the false report. And so there are a lot of issues with the author's sample size. You know, he often notes not, you know, talking to too many people or people didn't want to talk to him or they had moved or they were unavailable. Just lots of issues all around. But for a freshman, he wrote a nice paper. <laughs> I will say it's very well written. When I was TAing, I would have given the kid a very good grade on this. But I don't think that we can use something like this in order to explain this this big event um, because he just didn't he didn't hit all the marks. He didn't bring everything together. Robert Bartholomew, a scholar who's written a lot about the mad gasser of Mattoon and the gasser of Botetourt County, Virginia, 
wrote a book a few years ago called Panic Attacks, The History of Mass Delusion. And he cites a number of examples of fear in the news media during this time about German gas attacks on the United States. In fact, Bartholomew paints the Mad Gasser incident almost entirely in terms of this particular fear. This is how the section on the Mad Gasser starts, quote, another terrorism scare, this one involving an imaginary chemical weapons attack, took place in a small American Midwestern city whose residents were facing a crisis of a different nature as the media warned of the possible use of such weapons by the Axis powers two and a half months after the D-Day invasion of Normandy. So there's no question that the media had been hyping the dangers of chemical warfare. And Bartholomew presents a number of citations to national magazines like Newsweek, stuff that people in Metun probably would have been reading, talking about, you know, will the Germans carry out this desperation attack? But these fears aren't really present in the news reports about the mad gasser. I think there's one mention of an escaped German prisoner of war from a camp in Peoria in the same story where they said it was thought it might be a German POW, but it wasn't. So yes, there was a fear of gas attacks from the Germans. There's not convincing evidence to me in the reports from the time that people in Mattoon's first thought was, I got gassed by a Nazi in my bedroom last night. So I just don't think the connection is there. Yeah. And when you look, well, when we looked at the um, the newspapers online, you know, you can see a whole page of the newsprint and the headlines that dealt with the war didn't really address that either. Those headlines, I mean, they mentioned the war, but things aren't going horribly <laughs> um, for for us, for the allies. And there wasn't, I thought when I looked at the other headlines, it was going to be the fuel, you know, for the fire, right? And as I read it, it just wasn't. Again, they are taking in other forms of news and things, but in their local paper, that didn't seem to be something that was, you know, taking up front page space at while this was going on. But there's there's a long history of of mass panic and, and, and mass hysteria. So I just wanted to very, very briefly mention a couple other things that are brought up. And one is the dancing plague of 15. 15- 18. Um, and this occurred in Strasbourg. And at that time, it was in the Holy Roman Empire. And somewhere between 50 and 400 people took to dancing for days. People were compelled to dance and didn't stop. People died from dancing. <laughs> that's how that's how intense this this dancing plague was. You know, they they couldn't stop if they tried. And so this is often something that is connected to these MPIs or issues or incidences of mass panic. Another very famous one we have here at home of course is the and by at home, I mean in in the in North America, <laughs> um, is the Salem witch trials. Uh, so you know we have these girls who begin claiming that you know specters are attacking them and everything. And there's again a lot of very gendered stuff and a lot of things to unpack in that situation. But so many people got got swept up into this that you know people lost their lives from it, and it was a very real fear. And of course, there's religious aspects to it, you know, aspects of being in the, quote, colonial wilderness and the, um, the the Native Americans that were around at the time. So a lot of things, a lot of fears, a lot of a lot of issues. But still, this is this is another one of those cases where even if one of those girls had started off with some kind of motive to get something, the rest just followed. They all came together and, you know, sort of imagined lied, whatever it was, or really thought that that something was happening to them. Um, and even if we think about um, more recently, um, you know, with with some of the things that have been going on with uh, uh, COVID-19, I one day convinced myself I couldn't taste anything <laughs> because the mind is a, it's a powerful thing. And, you know, so all of a sudden, if you know that your neighbor got gassed, you know, two nights ago and in the middle of the night you smell something a little off 
where's your brain going to go? You know, it's going to go to the panic place. <laughs> and, um, and, and then, you know, we all know that psychosomatic illnesses exist. And, and, you know, so how, how powerful, how powerful can that be? Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that this idea that it could be this mass panic or MPI situation is not, it's not unreasonable. So there's a man who believes the hysteria aspect is not the right solution. And his name is Scott Maruna. And he wrote a book in 2003 called The Mad Gasser of Mattoon, Dispelling the Hysteria. He's a chemistry teacher. And his basic argument is that there was a mad gasser. It was not mass hysteria. And he gets a little worked up about it. He says, what difference does it make, you might ask? Well, in the big picture of life, probably very little. But doesn't it deserve the slightest amount of anger or at least disappointment when even a little bit of our limited long-term memory is hijacked to hold a falsehood, one that was promoted as the truth? This is the final object of this book, correcting something that you have been taught falsely. <laughs> He says chemicals that caused the reported effects could have been easily replicated by amateur chemists. And he also discusses whether or not the hysteria explanation was the result of a cover up. He sort of speculates on this. He thinks it might be the academic establishment clinging to its use of Mattoon as an example of psychogenic illness who are, you know, resistant to other explanations because I don't know, they'd have to. It, what issue a new edition of the textbook, <laughs> which they do every year anyway, uh, or that that he says maybe a newspaper concocted the story as a hoax that got out of hand, or my favorite, the military, which may have quote chosen Mattoon as an odd testing ground for experimental gases, and, and he he highlights public anger at the police for not solving the issue, and that the the people's anger was was justified because the police were dragging their feet he goes into a lot of stuff about the the politics between the city and the police department at the time it's um it's a wild ride yeah and then he has an entire chapter on paranormal events seemingly to demonstrate that there are things that science can explain, but the gasser is not one of those things. The gasser is, in fact, explainable. And I'm going to read this this little passage because it mentions some of our some of our best friends, <laughs> not best friends, <laughs> some of our interests in here. But it says he's he, uh, Maruna wrote the ideas that the Mothman, some ghosts, only some. Bigfoot and Mattoon's Mad Gasser are all residents of a parallel universe who, during exceedingly rare opportunities, travel through an ever-shifting portal between our two realities, or the U.S. government perpetrated a Mattoon into guinea pig experiment are fun, entertaining, and mind-stretching. But as far as the Mad Gasser of Mattoon is concerned, let's step back into rationality. The Mad Gasser's name was Farley. Farley Llewellyn. Maruna claims that Farley, who was a homosexual and an alcoholic, um, was a brilliant amateur chemist and that Farley Llewellyn was behind things. The town was opposed to Farley and his homosexuality. Farley had been in and out of mental health facilities and had some resentment about that. And Maruna argues that Farley Llewellyn was taking his anger out on the town with a few attacks of the gas, but he is unable to continue for some reason. And his sisters, Florence and Catherine, take over for him. And Maruna says that this accounts for variations in the appearance of the gasser. And it accounts for the lipstick. And it accounts for the one instance in which there was a woman's shoe footprint. So You've got multiple mad gassers from this family. Maruna also claimed that Farley hit targets closer to his age and his younger sisters hit younger targets, people they didn't like for one reason or another. He says the police suspected Farley. And uh, on the 11th of September, right when things started to calm down, Farley was placed in a state mental hospital by his family and would be there most of the rest of his life. Now, Maruna acknowledges that he had no access to any police records. His FOIA request for the FBI stuff came up empty also, and neither could he get his hands on Llewellyn's mental health records. His sources were mostly extremely elderly people 
who remembered what was going on at the time and knew Farley. And in one case, he's got an actual parenthetical citation that says, source, a number of elderly people I talked to, or words to that effect. It was not quite as bad as source the internet, (laughs) or Wikipedia. pretty close. Actually, Wikipedia would be better because you can follow that trail sometimes. Yes, you can follow the, the rabbit trail of citations. Maruna is is convinced it's Farley Llewellyn. Maybe it was. It's one of these things where, well, how do you know it's not? Well, I don't know it's not, but I know that the evidence presented isn't sufficient to persuade me that it was. I'm not discounting it completely. I'm just saying the evidence is lacking. Now it's time to jump into our conclusions, if we can call them that. It's not like we're going to tell you a definitive, this is what actually happened. You've listened to us talk for this long when we could have just told you what happened at the beginning. Um, No, that's not the situation. Um, But we're going to tell you sort of, you know, what what we think could have happened, the the theory we like the best, perhaps the one that we, you know, if someone, you know, forced us to pick one, we'd pick one, or maybe what our what our takeaways are from this. So um, Aaron, did you want to go first? Yeah, I think it's a great example of how people who are enthusiastic (laughs) about the paranormal will find a way to make anything paranormal and this kind of goes back to our last Mm -hmm. episode as well this i think especially nick redfern's stuff really piqued my interest because it's it's this trying to draw these parallels and trying to draw these connections same thing with the spring hill jack stuff we've all heard this phrase from some people you've got to connect the dots Mm -hmm. you know let's connect the dots and connecting the dots i mean if there are no dots you're making your dots wherever you (laughs) one, right? There's a cluster of dots here and a cluster of dots here. So I, I think it's it's a great example of how a story can be molded and reshaped and remain actually largely true to the original events as we've seen, but with things grafted on just enough to muddy the waters a lot. Yeah. So so I'm just I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that I think a thing happened initially. It's a bizarre thing to suddenly occur. And in order for there to be sort of a mass psychogenic illness, everybody should be experiencing it at once. Like something should kick that off, you know, you'd think or something. And so I think initially maybe a thing happened and and then that kicked off <laughs> after it, sort of sort of a panic. And what that initial thing was. I, I don't think it was supernatural. <laughs> um, I I enjoy the Farley Llewellyn theory um, that seems to make a level of sense that none of the other explanations do for me. I don't think there's a way for us to find out at this point <laughs> what what actually happened. And the other thing that I find interesting with this and and with these other more paranormal stories, but stories that have been connected to it, like Spring Heel Jack, is that people can take a thing, they can take this person or this incident or whatever, and then turn it into whatever they want to. They can morph it. They can, to your point, Aaron, you know, grasp at the paranormal and turn it into that. But there's enough detail to spark an idea, but not enough for it to be definitive. So that gives it that gives us the power over it, if that makes sense, the power to yes. to make it whatever yes. we want it to be, to meet whatever needs we want, whether we're paranormal enthusiasts or a chemistry teacher trying to get to the heart of the matter or, or, you know, whatever that is. And I think it's interesting that most of the accounts, like, like you said, that we looked at present the pieces pretty factually, you know, like there is the same string of events that happened every once in a while, a weird thing gets thrown in, but generally it's a factual interpretation of at least what happened to these people or what these people did at the time, I guess, is the way to explain it. I agree. I think it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I think this was a richer story <laughs> than I imagined it would yes. be <laughs> when when I started working on this. I was like, OK, there's this series of events. What are we going to do? Tell the story and get out. But no, <laughs> there was a lot more as we as we pointed out. So be sure to keep those windows closed and watch out for gas. Thanks for listening. The Mad Gasser of Mattoon was written and produced by Aaron Gullius and Samantha Engel with additional dialogue by Simpson J. Hanover III. Our music is by Raphael Crux. Great Lakes Lore is a Chizo Media production. 
Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, don't get lost in the lore. <laughs>